just waiting for people to file in right now. There's about like 25 people. In attendance, waiting for attendees to top people off. While we wait, I just seems like we kind of reach a plateau. So before we start, I would like to give our interpreters a chance to introduce themselves. I will start with the, our Portuguese interpreters, uh, Rafa. Boa noite. Serviços de interpretação em português estão disponíveis para a reunião. Se quiser escutar em português, por favor, clicar no ícone na parte inferior direita da sua tela. Muito obrigado. Thank you so much. And then, Susana? Buenas noches, mi nombre es Susana. Esta reunión se está ofreciendo en español. Para escuchar en este canal, por favor, eh, oprima el icono del globo en la parte inferior de su pantalla y seleccione Spanish. Thank you. And now I'm going to start the interpretation channels. Uh... Interpretation channel has started, and I will hand it over to Harriot to introduce the uh, project and presentation. Harriot? Thank you, Og. Good evening. Welcome to our live virtual design public hearing. My name is Elvio Lamarck, and I am the project manager for the proposed low record between resurfacing and related work on Route 110 project, which will be presented tonight. I work in the project management section at the Massachusetts Department of Transportation Highway Division headquarters in Boston. The purpose of this evening is to provide a method for the Commonwealth to furnish to the public information concerning the state's highway construction proposals and to give every interested resident of the area the opportunity to be heard on the proposed project. Also, this hearing gives the Commonwealth an opportunity to receive information from local sources, which will be of value to the state in making decisions at the, as the design progresses. First, we would like to present some procedural elements of a design public hearing and review the functionality of the Zoom software. Kela Souza, one of our producers for the evening, will present that information. Thank you, Hario. My name is Kayla, and I am one of the MassDOT producers this evening, providing tech support and facilitating questions alongside Hung Fam. Let me take a moment to go over some Zoom basics. If you need to call into the meeting, you can call 309-205-3325 and use webinar ID 845-9428-5226. Zoom tech support can be reached at 1-888-799-9666. On the bottom left, you can find your audio controls. The chat function is disabled for this meeting so please direct your written questions to the Q&A box. You can type questions at any time and we will answer them at the end of the presentation where we will also allow participants to ask questions verbally. Please note that while Zoom provides automatic closed captions, they may not be entirely accurate. 
Interpretive services are available in Spanish and Portuguese for this meeting by clicking on the globe icon at the bottom right corner of the audio control bar. Finally, we would like to know more about how many people are using our interpretive services tonight. I'm launching a poll which asks what language you are currently listening in. Choice one is English, choice two is Spanish, and choice three is Portuguese. We will not share the results of this poll with the audience and the poll is completely anonymous. This poll is so the project team can understand which audiences we are reaching and we appreciate you taking the time to fill it out. This hearing is being recorded and all parts of public hearings are public records. So MassDOT can retain and distribute all parts of this hearing. If you type a question or ask one verbally, know that you will be a part of the record. So please use both functions for project related business only. If you're not comfortable being included in those types of records, you can choose to just listen in today or excuse yourself from the hearing entirely. Again, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. All questions and comments are welcome. However, please refrain from any disrespectful comments. Lastly, a survey will pop up at the end of this hearing. Please take the time to answer it. Your feedback is important to us. On your screen now is the MassDOT Diversity and Civil Rights Statement. If you are interested in learning more about our diversity and civil rights policies, and how they affect our public hearings, please contact the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights. A handout for this meeting has been prepared and posted to the MassDOT website. If you would like to retrieve that handout now, you will find documentation which may be useful to you in understanding the project and submitting formal comments in response to this presentation. Moving forward, you will see that the notice of hearing is included on page two of the handout. This notice appeared in Lowell Sun, Eagle Tribune, and Merrimack Journal on September 6, 2023 and September 13, 2023. We thank the municipalities of Lowell, Dracut, Methuen, and other important networks for spreading the word. A copy of this notice will be attached to the final hearing transcript. I will now okay. hand things back over to our project manager, Hario, to introduce the team. Thank you, thank you, Kila, thank you. So now let me welcome the team members who have joined me this evening. First, Brian Fallon, the district project development engineer for Mass DOT District 4. Thank you, Brian for your support with this project. Next, Bridget Myers, the district project manager, and Emma Antido, the traffic engineer from Augustine Hudson, the design consultant for this project. Bridget has done a tremendous job for us. Then, Michael Wooderman, Go representative for my DOT. Michael will cover the work requirements. Our producer for this evening, we have a young fan and Kela Souza. Both are also program managers at my DOT. And we have also, we are also it should be Charlene, but he is a program coordinator for the Office of Public Engagement and Outreach responsible for this event. We also be assisted by Susanna Carilla, Spanish interpreter, Rafa Ferri and Alisa Clements, Portuguese interpreters, and we have Anna Saliba, Scenographer from Advanced Court Reporters. During this presentation, we will explain the purpose of this project. 
explain our approach to the project and indicate how you may be affected. Also, we will explain how, how you can submit your comments and questions about the project, which may be included in the official hearing transcripts. We just started with the welcome and opening remarks and will continue with project overview, existing conditions, project goals and proposed design. Then we will assess the project impact on the environment and what of way. The construction approach and the next step will be discussed before question and feedback. We estimate the total project will cost approximately 19, 19 million dollars. Federal funding with Federal Highway Administration funding 80% and mass DOT funding the remaining 20% of the total construction costs. This project must be programmed in the statewide transportation improvement program in the appropriate federal fiscal year in order for mass DOT to solicit bids for eventual construction. The total estimate cost of the project does not include any right of way acquisition cost. The design is expected to be complete in spring of 2024. Now, we can move on the substance of the presentation. I am going to turn the presentation over to Bridget Myers from HSH, who has been written by my duty. Please keep in mind that the project we are presenting is still in the very early design stage. All your questions and comments will be taken into consideration when completing the project's design. Bridget? Thanks, Hario. You're welcome. So how did we get here? So this 6.3 mile stretch of Route 110 was slated to be repaved as part of Mass DOT District 4's maintenance and resurfacing program. However, instead of simply resurfacing and putting back the same striping and layout, MassDOT wanted to see if there was any room for improvement in the cross section so that bicyclists and pedestrians could also benefit from this work. In October of 2020, Howard Stein Hudson, um, also known as HSH, began an alternatives analysis for MassDOT to compare the different options for the proposed roadway cross section, which we will discuss in a few, few slides. The alternatives analysis report was completed and submitted to MassDOT in September of 2021. After a preferred alternative was selected, HSH received the notice to proceed in May of 2022 and began working on our design project. In October of 2022, HSH submitted the 25% design package to MassDOT, and after that submittal was reviewed and discussed, approval was given to proceed to the design public hearing night to solicit feedback on the design. Project area. Uh, this is a 6.3 mile segment of Route 110, and it begins in Lowell just west of First Street Boulevard near the walkway condominiums. The reason this location was chosen as the project start is that it's right by the entrance to the Merrimack River bike path, which is located just behind those condominiums. And then the project is, extends east through the entire limits of Dracut and then into Methuen, where the project ends at the intersection of Route 110 at Riverside Drive. The project originally stopped just west of the Riverside Drive intersection as that intersection has been recently reconstructed, but there would be minor, in order to fill that gap um, to get us up to the signal, there'll be a minor changes to the west side of the intersection just in order to make that connection. 
Why was this project initiated? The project was originated in order to improve the deteriorating pavement conditions on the Route 110 corridor. As was previously mentioned, this began as just a maintenance resurfacing project. However, there's also a noticeable gap in the bike network between Lowell and Lawrence, as this long corridor could help fill that gap. <clears throat> there's also existing bicycle infrastructure connecting to both the western and eastern limits of the project limits. Other needs that came to light as the design began include safety improvements due to high vehicle speeds and improving the existing pedestrian infrastructure. So the pavement needs, um, the pavement maintenance. Route 110 was selected for maintenance due to the deteriorating, deteriorating pavement condition. There's potholes, cracking, delamination, and raveling along the Route 110 corridor. Resurfacing and maintenance on this pavement now will prevent more costly reconstruction on this corridor later. The photos in this slide show examples of the existing pavement condition on Route 110. The photo. Next one. There we go. Uh, the photo on the left shows a utility trench, alligator cracking, and pore compaction. The center photo shows pothole patching, weathering, and block cracking. And the right photo shows pore compaction, possible heaving, block cracking that has been repaired by crack seal and weathering. Next slide. So the, one of the other needs was filling the gap in the bike network. So apart from pavement resurfacing, this corridor was also identified as having a potential to fill a large piece of the gap in the state's bike network. This map shows the existing Merrimack River bike path in Lowell on the west end in purple, and the existing on-street bike lanes in Methuen at the east end of the project area shown in blue. And while this map shows how the project can fill a direct gap in the bike network along the corridor, if we were looking at even a more zoomed out area of the region, you'd see that there is an absence of really any major east-west routes for bikes to be able to travel between the Lowell and Lawrence areas. Reviewing existing conditions, it was clear that the existing sidewalk along the north side of Route 110 was in poor condition, missing in some locations and not ADA compliant. In order to improve safety for all users, the sidewalk needs to be reconstructed along the whole corridor. The project also aims to address safety for vehicles by resurfacing the roadway and modifying the large lane width. In our review of seven years of historic crash data, we found that the key safety issues are related to speeding, horizontal curves along the corridor, lane departure collisions where vehicles encroach over the center line or edge lines, and angled collisions at some of the side streets. What do we want to accomplish? The major goals of this project include improving pavement conditions by resurfacing and providing safe accommodations for all users, which will be accomplished by improving the pedestrian infrastructure, adding bicycle infrastructure, and implementing vehicle safety countermeasures, which we will discuss in later slides. Another goal of this project is to accomplish meeting the project needs while also keeping the project scope closer to that of a resurfacing project versus a full corridor reconstruction project. <clears throat> pedestrian activity is low on Route 110, but it's higher in surrounding areas. This could be due to the lack of pedestrian accommodations on the Route 110 corridor. There is an existing sidewalk on the north side, but it's not ADA compliant, nor is it comfortable for any user. It's narrow and overgrown with vegetation in places. There's currently no existing sidewalk on the south side of Route 110. This project will improve pedestrian infrastructure by reconstructing the sidewalk to be at least five feet wide and fill gaps where the sidewalk is missing today. The sidewalk will also include ADA compliant ramps at side streets. There is currently no bicycle infrastructure along the corridor. There's an entrance to the Merrimack River bike path near the Western project limits. And the Eastern end of the project connects to existing on-road bike lanes in Methuen. Due to the high speeds of this corridor, the project would want to incorporate a separate would want to incorporate a separated bike facility that has more of a physical separation between vehicles and bikes. This slide shows bicycle act bicyclist activity in the area based on data from the app Strava. 
Strava is a pedestrian and bicycle recreational app that tracks user data to generate heat maps that show areas and routes of high utilization. Our project area is outlined in blue on both maps. The map on the left is from 2020-2021 during the pandemic when there was significantly less people out driving around and in turn it shows the bike activity is high. On the right is the most recent map from the 2022-23 period, which now shows our corridor as more of the orange color depicting medium activity. The reason we wanted to show these maps is to highlight that when there is a comfortable facility, like in 2020, when there was less drivers on the road, more people will get out and bike. This project has the potential to create a new comfortable facility along the corridor, and hopefully we will see the bike activity increase once again. What alternatives were considered? On the next slides, we'll go through the various alternatives that were considered for this project. The, fir the first alternative that was evaluated would have involved paving and restriping only. The proposed cross section would consist of two 11 foot travel lanes and two five foot buffered bike lanes. The vehicle lanes, bike lanes and buffers would be within the existing curb to curb layout. Which, have, which would have resulted in the narrowing or removal of the buffer where space is limited by left turn lanes. While this would be the lowest cost, it would also provide the lowest benefit and not address the sidewalks. Alternative two builds off alternative one, but also includes reconstruction of the sidewalk. The road would be resurfaced and the proposed cross section would also consist of the 11 foot travel lanes and five foot buffered bike lanes. While this alternative does improve pedestrian accommodations on the north side, there's still no pedestrian access on the south side. The buffered bike lanes also do not provide any physical barrier between the vehicles and the bikes. Alternative three was a grade separated shared use path. This proposes a cross section consisting again of 11 foot travel lanes in each direction, two foot shoulders and a five foot sidewalk on the north side and a 10 foot shared use path on the south side of the road with a four foot grass buffer. While this option does check all the boxes for achieving the project needs, it misses the project goal of staying closer to the scope of a resurfacing project. In this alternative, the shared use path would be separated by a six inch reveal curb. This alternative would significantly change the drainage of the roadway, requiring extensive drainage improvements, increasing the level of environmental of environmental permitting and would significantly increase the construction cost. This alternative takes us too far out of the scope for a maintenance resurfacing project. Alternative four consists of 11 foot travel lanes in each direction, a two foot shoulder on the north side of the road and a 10 foot at grade shared use path on the south side that's gonna be separated by the travel lanes by a six foot buffer containing guardrail or in some instances flex posts. The buffer does narrow to two feet in isolated areas where there are left turn lanes, but the flex posts would, would still remain in those spots. This alternative also proposes to reconstruct the sidewalk on the north side of the road. The at-grade shared use path can be used by bikes and pedestrians. The use of guardrail or flex posts instead of curb allows existing drainage patterns to remain. What is the preferred alternative? The preferred alternative is alternative four, the at-grade shared use path. This alternative provides pedestrian and bicycle accommodations while, al while also minimizing environmental impacts, construction disturbance, and cost. This alternative meets the project needs and satisfies the project goals. How will our design function? This slide shows a plan view of a typical proposed layout for the corridor. The proposed five foot sidewalk on the north side, the 11 foot travel lane, six foot buffer with the guardrail and a proposed 10 foot shared use path on the south side. Next slide. How will bicyclists and pedestrians be impacted? This project proposes to accommodate bicyclists with a 10 foot shared use path on the south side of the roadway. This path will be separated from the vehicle travel lanes by a six foot buffer containing either guardrail or flex posts. This separation provides a high level of comfort and safety for bicyclists using this path. Guardrail will be provided throughout most of the corridor, but flex posts will be used in areas where there are frequent 
driveway crossings or in constrained areas where the buffer narrows, such as areas where there's left turn lanes. This photo is from a similar facility on Bayview Ave in Toronto. As part of this project, the existing sidewalk on the north side of Route 110 will be reconstructed. Five and a half foot wide ADA compliant sidewalk will be provided as will ADA compliant pedestrian curb ramps. On the south side of the corridor, the pedestrians will be accommodated with the 10 foot shared use path. One part of the proposed design that is still being evaluated is where we can place crossings along the corridor. The vehicle speeds, the high vehicle speeds limit our options. There's currently only one crosswalk along the corridor that's not at a signal, and that is the one near Walbrook, Walbrook Street in Methuen by JG's Ice Cream, and that one has faded over the years. We did do a gap study by a, at a selection of locations along the corridor to see if there are sufficient gaps in vehicle traffic for someone to safely cross. We also want to use tonight's discussion to get feedback on where you all think crosswalks would be most needed or desired. This map shows the locations that were used in the gap study. Location one is near the intersection of Haverhill Street. Number two is between Nassau Street and Pickney Street. Number three is near Draycott Ave, where there is an existing bus stop. Number four is near Wheeler Street. Number five is near Wahlberg Street. Not shown on this map is Griffinbrook, or shown on this map is Griffinbrook Drive, and that's the only location within this corridor that are that has a traffic signal. So there will be at least that one signalized crossing there. So we'd like to take a moment now to do a quick poll for the audience. You'll see all five of these locations as well as an other option. Please vote for where you think a crossing is needed or wanted. We would also encourage you to use the Q&A function to add in your comments related to this topic. After tonight's meeting, we will take any new information we receive from you and continue our evaluation. However, even with tonight's feedback, any crossings will still need, need, still need to meet the appropriate design guidelines. So even if there is a popular response, it does not necessarily mean that that location will end up with a crosswalk. In that slide, uh, the poll is up now. We have about 22 out of 30 people who have responded, about 73% uh, participating, which is great. Um, I don't see any more votes coming in, so I'm just going to end it there. Thanks. Sounds good. Thank you. Now, actually, before we end it up, we will share the... Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely share the poll. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So how will the road user be affected? The design proposes a few changes to how the roadway will operate for vehicle users. Overall, the pavement condition will be much better, but the lanes are proposed to be narrower, narrower than they are today. Wherever there is an existing left turn pocket to access a side street or neighborhood, the design maintains those left turn pockets, but enhances the markings and ensures vehicles have adequate space to decelerate prior to turning left. There is only one signalized intersection within the study area at Griffin Brook Park. The intersection was analyzed using traffic modeling software and traffic volumes were grown to a future condition to ensure that there would be not any significant impacts to queuing or delay with the proposed changes. Based on that peak hour traffic analysis, the design proposes only one through lane and one turn lane for each of the Route 110 approaches at the Griffin Brook Park Drive. The excess width from what was previously used as a second through lane on Route 110 was used to continue the shared use path through the intersection. Additionally, the design proposes installing pedestrian signal equipment at the traffic signal to give pedestrians a phase in which to cross. As previously mentioned, the key safety issues that were noticed 
during reviewing historic crash trends are related to speeding, the curves along the corridor, lane departure collisions where vehicles encroach over the center lines or edge lines, and angled collisions at some of the side streets. The design implements countermeasures for each of the crash trends identified. Resurfacing the roadway and improving paving conditions has been proven to reduce crash, reduce crash frequency. To address curve-related crashes, the design proposes fluorescent signage to warn drivers of curves ahead. Within the horizontal curves, the design proposes chevron signage like shown in the top photo, which has been proven to reduce nighttime and high severity crashes at curves. To address lane departure collisions, the design proposes a center lane rumble strip for a portion of the corridor where there was a notable number of collisions where one vehicle encroached over the center line. With speeding being identified as a safety concern along the corridor, the design proposes LED speed feedback signs periodically along the corridor for, to provide real-time feedback to drivers on the speed at which they are currently traveling. To provide a wider range of sight distance for vehicles turning onto Route 110 from side streets, the work will include trimming sight, obstruction veget sight obstructing vegetation to lessen the chance of angle collisions when turning out of side streets. How will your property be impacted? I'm now going to turn over to Michael Ritterman from the State Right Away section, who is going to now explain that process. Thank you, Bridget. Yes, my name is Michael Ritterman. I'm a member of MassDOT's Right of Way section within the Highway Department. This is usually the point in the presentation where I explain what sorts of easements, whether temporary or permanent, are anticipated need, being needed in order to provide the working space to get this job done, or if there are going to be any permanent takings of fee takings that, that we need to add to the, um, the actual area of the room that the road occupies. In this case, we are not anticipating needing any easements in order to accomplish the goals of this project. Let me just say though, that if that changes, we will get back in touch with anyone whose property, whose specific location is actually going to be affected by, by those takings and we'll make appointments, I and my staff, to explain everything to you, uh, especially the protections that are in both state and federal law to those persons whose properties would be impacted, how they're going to be compensated for those damages, how we'll get the payments to you. But like I said, in this case, we're not anticipating at this time that we're going to need to take any easements, permanent or temporary, in order to accomplish the goals of this project. So I will stay on for the rest of the meeting. If anyone has any other questions about right-of-way in general, I'll be available at the end for that. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Bridget. You might. So what are the environmental, cultural, resource, and community impacts? This project is within the riverfront area of the Merrimack River, and there are several areas of wetlands located along the corridor. Therefore, notice of intents are expected to be filed with the City of Lowell Conservation Commission, the Town of Drake Conservation Commission, and the City of McGowan Conservation Commission, as well as the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. What is the construction approach? This project will utilize a phased construction approach, and that will be approximately two, two and a half years. No detour routes are anticipated, only short-term closures. Safe and accessible pedestrian routes will be maintained throughout the construction duration and a butter access will be maintained throughout construction. After this hearing, the next step will be the 75 slash 100% design submission to MassDOT, which is planned for next month in October. MassDOT will complete their review of this submission in the early winter of 2023, later this year, and the PSNE design will be submitted in the winter of 2024. The project is expected to advertise for construction in March of 2024, with construction anticipated and start anticipating to start in the summer 2024. And now I'm going to hand it back to Harry O. Hello, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. 
So thank you so so much. I state briefly the purpose of this evening is to solicit your input regarding this project. As the plans are not yet complete, we may not be able to answer all of your questions or respond to all of your comments at this time. The last sheet of the handout is a mailing sheet. If you have any questions or comments which you will, which you like to submit in writing, you may use this sheet for that purpose. You may mail it to the department within 10 days of this date, and it will become part of the official record. You may also follow the links of your screen to send us your comments or questions. Please remember to identify yourself by name and affiliation, whether you are a Abute local official or concerned citizen. We are back to Kela, please. Sure, thanks, Mario. We're going to go over how the Q&A will work now. Um, to ask a question verbally, you can click the raise hand icon, and Hung will give you access to unmute your microphone. You'll need to unmute it yourself to be heard. If you prefer to type a question, you can click on the Q&A icon and write your question, and I will read it out loud. For both methods, please ask only one question at a time so everyone gets a chance to participate. We will follow a two minute rule to the number of participants tonight and the number of questions already in the queue. So please be respectful of others' time. You can always raise your hand again or submit another question in the Q&A box to rejoin the queue. One final reminder that once you exit the Zoom webinar, a survey will automatically pop up. Please take a minute to fill it out. It's very short and your feedback is important to us. Before we begin the public Q&A, we do have a tradition of letting any public or elected officials offer their comments or questions first. <clears throat> if there are any public or elected officials who would like to offer comment, please raise your hand and use the Q&A box to put your title um, if your Zoom name, if it's not in your Zoom name, so that we can recognize you properly. So are there any federal, state, or local officials who would like to speak at this time? All right, seeing none. Okay, um, so at this point, we're gonna read the questions from the question and answer and we'll rotate between that and raised hands if anyone chooses to raise their hand. Mm -hmm. So the first question is from Stuart Malice. Uh, can we download a transcript of the hearing after its conclusion? If so, how? So uh, I got your email, Stuart, so, and yes, I think you will be able, okay, to do that. So if Stuart emails you, then you'll send the transcript. And yep, there's the email right there on the slide. Just want to uh, elaborate on that is uh, if you email to mass dot project management at dot.state.ma.us using the project number 608816 and ask for the transcript that yes. will be sent over. Yeah, I got the email. We'll do that. Correct. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next written question is from Tina Rivard. I believe the town of Drakeit would like to weigh in on where crosswalk could be considered in the neighborhoods of the town. I suppose that's more of a, a comment than a question. But does anyone on the project team have anything to add about coordination with the town? I mean, we can uh, certainly reach out to the town, see if they have 
a chance to review any of the plans that have been submitted at 25% and see if they have any feedback for this specific question as well. Thanks, Bridget. All right, next comment is from Maureen Graham. There may be an issue with a crosswalk and Drake it or at Drake it. So many accidents happen on this stretch. Yeah, that we it's kind of why we wanted to bring up, you know, the options tonight. We know there's no like obvious great place to put one. Um, the reason that location was looked at um uh, was mostly because there's that um MVRTA bus uh stop in that area. And usually with bus stops, you it's it's nice to have a crossing, but that you know, it would still need to kind of cover all our uh design guidelines for safety. So um, but that that was the reason that location was at least looked at. Perfect. Thank you. All right. I'm going to read the next comment aloud, um, but I don't think necessarily needs a response. Just going to say it out loud for anyone in the interpretation channels. Uh, William Shanahan writes, finding traffic gaps at busy times is extremely difficult. Yes. I think we would agree with that. Um, next comment in the Q&A before we switch over to our hands that have been waiting is from Elizabeth Altman. Is a crossing in Lowell at First Street possible? The Centerville neighborhood of Lowell is cut off from the bicycle lanes on the south side of Route 115. Um, we can look at that area. Um, the project limits extended, it slightly changed. Um, in Lowell, that area was in Lowell was added um, after twenty five percent. So we can, but we can definitely go back and reevaluate that section to see if there's any way we can get a connection to the First Street area. So we would like to uh, recognize Elizabeth is for is it transportation engineering for in Lowell? What is it? Elizabeth, we would like to acknowledge your presence. Thank you. Um, I will now shift over to the Q&A raise hand portion. Um, just want to elaborate one more time. If I see that there are a couple people who are actually dialed in. So if you want to raise your hand, please press star nine. And to actually unmute yourself, you can press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, I will um, start with Edward Johnson. Edward? You could unmute yourself now. Ah, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. All right, just want to give you a little quick background on who I am. My name is Edward Johnson. I've been in law enforcement for 25 years. I patrolled this stretch of road for most of that. I currently live on this road and own two pieces of property. I'm also old enough to remember when this was four lanes, four lanes of traffic going uh, two lanes in each direction. And it was one of the deadliest roads in the state. In order to cut back on crashes, they widened the travel lanes and only made it two lanes in each direction. So this, um, I, I have many questions, but I'll start with this one first. How is narrowing the travel lanes going to improve safety when we had narrow travel lanes and we had many, many, many crashes? I mean, even currently, I was counting today, I've been to 12 fatalities on this road and I've had six crashes directly in front of my house. I've been over 50 crashes in my career on this stretch of road and I can't see how narrowing this road is going to uh, make any benefit to safety whatsoever. Um, with that said, you know, the mail carrier and the garbage truck come down the road. If the traffic lane is only 11 feet wide, how is a fully loaded tractor trailer coming from one of the two quarries here going to pass the garbage truck both of these vehicles are over eight feet wide so if they were touching mirrors that's 16 feet that's sticking five feet into oncoming traffic this is going to lead to a tremendous amount of uh fatalities out here uh, I'm, I'm very very concerned with this and just wonder what your input is i have other questions that we'll get to later but i figured i'll go with this one first thank you You respond or Ima will respond the budget. Sure. I mean, generally, 
um, just kind of like general design practice that we've been seeing over the years is that when travel lanes are narrowed, it does slow down traffic because it creates kind of a less comfortable environment. Um, typically when you have a wider space to go, cars tend to go faster because you know it's more comfortable. They're not worried about <clears throat> um, going up against any other cars. Um, this will be narrowing the whole corridor. Um, so it's just going to, you know, it could create, um, you know, people will have to slow down. They'll have to kind of stop for issues like that instead of just where it was two lanes, you know, being able to just pass by and have more passing on there. You know, there won't be that comfortable area for anyone to try to pass on this road any further. But, um, you know, instead, but it's still at 25% design stage. So any of these comments are very helpful for us to take into consideration. Uh, Bridget, this is Brian Fallon, uh, District 4 Project Development Engineer. I think also um, that you had mentioned that it used to be a four-lane roadway, two lanes in each direction. I think we've found out that that type of roadway with the opportunities for crashes are very high because of people crossing from one lane, having to cross over two lanes, and there's courtesy crashes, there's people going at different speeds, people not paying attention. I think the fact that it went to one lane in each direction certainly helped the uh, safety of the roadway and would reduce those kind of crossover crashes. But we had wide lanes and wide shoulders. And I think when you have that combination, people do drive the road faster. They feel comfortable driving the road fast. I think using the um, 11 foot lanes with the two foot shoulders, uh, it's kind of a, a subconscious calming effect for, for roadway users. So. What we expect by using this technique is that people will drive a little bit slower on this roadway and pay a little bit more attention. And that's that was kind of our, our thinking on that uh, design. Thank you. Great. Um, I'll move on to the next person, uh, Robert. I believe you can unmute yourself now, Robert. Robert, are you there? Okay, we will circle back with Robert. And continue on with uh, Karen. Karen? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, I, my name is Karen Chappelle. I'm the president of the Cascades Board of Governors. And I was basically wondering what the impact would be on the Cascades property itself. We just install, installed a new granite sign at the corner of Brook Street and Merrimack Ave. Um, would that have to be moved? And also there's a stone retaining wall on part of the property as it heads towards Lowell. Would that have any impact on that stone wall? Would that have to come down? Thank you. We weren't question. having, yeah, we, I don't think that either of those items were would be impacted. Um, I don't think we so. Were, okay. We weren't having any. Yeah, we weren't having any. I don't recall any signage or, or retaining walls being impacted on this. The sidewalk's pretty much being reconstructed where it is today. Mm -hmm. um, in some areas, maybe being slightly widened, but yeah, we weren't. We were as of right now. We're not showing any changes to retaining walls or signs. Okay, nothing to do then with the Cascades property. No. Okay. Okay. No, that looks like it's set back. Yeah, no, it's fine. Okay. All right, good. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll go one more and then we we'll switch over to the Q&A session uh, here. Uh, let's start with a person who just called in, uh, ending in 877. If you can press star six to unmute yourself, definitely can do that. Anyone out there ending in 877? Hi, it's it's Mark. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Definitely. Thank you. 
Yeah, hi. I live on um, 486 Lowell Street, so this would be uh, right near the new restaurant that's going in, right by where, um, you know, um, the, the, the health club, Marjorie Street, that area. So I live on the riverside, and uh, I'm a boater, avid boater. I have a 21-foot boat. So in order to get my boat in the driveway, I need to um, use the breakdown lane um, to back, to slowly back it in. I need some people to help me control traffic. But, um, you know, it's, it's, a pretty good, it's a pretty big job. I do it several times a summer. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't want to be restricted in any way from using, um, you know, the river and my property. Um, when I have work done on my house, I have um, construction vehicles parked in front of my house along Wall Street um, to, uh, um, to load and unload, um, you know, uh, different construction vehicles that they use on my land. So, you know, I, I don't want to be losing the ability to have work done on my home and uh, losing access to be able to pull my boat in and out on Lowell Street. Um, that's good information for us to know. Um, it would be good to have, you could possibly email that information over. I, I mean, I have the address down right now. I think, I think you should be okay because there'll still be that wide area where the path is. Um, and, you know, if we know kind of what type of vehicles would be going in and out of your property, we can make sure to leave a wide enough opening with the driveway spaces as, as well to make sure that those aren't, you know, that trucks can come in and out and not, um, be impeded. Um, excuse me, Mark, can we get your last name for the record, please? Thank you. Oh, no. I'm fairly certain we removed their permission to talk, but um, that could, can come in the Q&A or in an email. So, Mark, if you want to just do that, that would be helpful. All right, we're going to move to some of the written questions again. So an anonymous attendee asked, would there be a change in the speed limit? I don't know if uh, that's kind of come up in discussion just about... Um, you know, it would be good to design for a lower speed in this area. I don't think it's, a, it's as simple as just setting it as a lower speed limit. Um, I don't, Brian, did you have want to add to this? Sure, uh, you're right. We, we just can't arbitrarily lower the speed limit, but the hope is if we do the um, lane narrowing and add the, um, the bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, the road will be in, I think there's speed feedback signs included in this project. The hope is these uh, different traffic calming measures add up to have an overall speed reduction on the roadway. At that time, we can go back out and do a speed study. This is the only way we can do or, or change a speed limit. We have to actually measure the speeds on the roadway as people drive it and we set the speed limit accordingly. So with the hope with the traffic calming is we can go back out at a later date and see if the, tra if the traffic has slowed down. And then at that time we can reset the uh, speed limit signs if, uh, if that proves to be true. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. All right, the next question is from Elena Santana. Uh, it says, my house and my neighbor have shared driveway and it's difficult as is to turn into our property and very dangerous. Could this be an opportunity for each house to have its own driveway? I don't know that we can change, you know, a residential driveways as part of this. You're right. Bridget, as part of the limited scope of this project, we really can't alter any private property. So I think we're, we're basically limited to working within the layout lines of Route 110 and the pavement surface itself. So that would have to be something that the um, property owners uh, do together to kind of rearrange their driveways. Thanks. If, there, if that owner wants to submit a comment with their kind of address and we could see if there's any, you know, vegetation improvements we can make within the right of way, mm. like some trim trimming to make things easier to see, but that's probably the extent of what we could do within this project. 
Yeah, good point, Bridget. Thank you both. All right, the next question I'll read is from Connor Hutchinson. Can we submit requests and ideas for additional crossing locations? And so in our poll, we had other as an option, um, but Zoom doesn't really let you write that in. And so um, Bridget or Harry, you could just let Connor and everyone know the best way to submit those ideas. Yeah, I mean, one way is, you know, you could put it in the chat right now, or if there was that email address at if the end. Yes, we have 10 days. If we think any comment in the, within 10 days, we part of the official records and, and we will address. We will not promise, but we will add, try our best to uh, respond and address the, our comments. Should we put that slide back up on? The screen, the... Yeah, Han, can you go to the slide that has the mass dot project management email again at the end? Perfect. There we go. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, next question from Brian Turgeon. Will there be any warning lights or other means of warning that a pedestrian is crossing? So that's something we're looking into um, because like we mentioned, based on the speeds, you know, you really, it's really best if there's some sort of signalization of, with the crossing, um, the speeds are too high to hear to use like the, just like the kind of crosswalk signs that just have the flashing beacons. Um, it's just the speeds are too high. We're at, kind of out of the realm of using that one. So, um, but, so I guess don't have a great answer, a direct, like, yes, definitely there'll be, uh, you know, flashing lights or signal, but, you know, that would, that is always like the safest mm -hmm. type of crossing where you have some sort of signalization. Great, thank you. And then I think one last uh, question from the chat before we switch to the raised hands again. Uh, this question is from C. Corbin. When is the next public meeting and will soft poles be installed in front of homes, which keeps hinders us? Um, I don't know about a next public meeting, but uh, I guess I'm not sure about that second question. Um, nothing's gonna be in, like blocking anyone's driveways or anything like that. Um, there would be, However, wherever, if we have guardrail or the flex posts, um, there would be gaps in those wherever there's a driveway. So you'll be able to, um, you know, get in and out of your, your driveways. Great, uh, let's switch over to raise hand. I see two. Um, I'm gonna try Robert again, have his hand raised. Robert, if you can unmute yourself, your microphone options actually on the lower left-hand side of the screen. Okay, let us circle back with you on that and I will continue on with Edward. Edward? All right, me again. Um, follow up to my first question. I, I really don't know if it was addressed. So when the mail carrier is driving down the street, putting the mail in the mailbox, with only an 11 foot lane and an eight foot wide track, the trailer comes down, are they going to have to follow the mail carrier all the way down to 93? That's my concern is that these trucks are going to be forced to cross over into oncoming traffic in order to safely pass the mail carrier or the Amazon delivery truck or even the garbage collection truck. These roads with the incredible amount of truck traffic from the two quarries, there has to be some way of allowing for vehicles to pass. So it is, you know, looking at the options, option two, if we have to have bike lanes, I think uh, alternative two is probably more appropriate for this road just to the, due to the volume of truck traffic. I just don't know what people expect the trucks to do or other traffic as they're following the mail carrier and the garbage truck down the road. Yeah, 
Yeah, so uh, I don't think uh, basically 12 going to 11 is not going really to change. Uh, I think it will be the same issue having 12 of 11. 11 feet wide is just to basically okay slow down the traffic. So uh, like that, people as a reflex to go a little slower uh, on a uh, 110. And but and we'll look at, at that uh, to see all the options we we'll revisited them, but uh, I don't think a uh, 12 to 11 would change anything with what we're dealing today on with 110. Yeah, we'll go take the take that issue into consideration and see if there's any kind of improvements that can be made related to that. Um, but I, guess, I know it's not a, I guess, a unique issue um, where we have run into this on other roads as well. All right, thank you both. Uh, switching back to some of the written questions, Stuart Mellis asks, has there been any consideration of a traffic light at the intersection of Wheeler Street and 110 in Methuen due to the high volume of traffic and especially heavy truck, tra truck traffic at that intersection. I could take this one on. Um, thanks for the question. But like previously mentioned, this is still um, a resurfacing project. So with a goal being to maintain the scope um, as close as possible to one of a resurfacing project, installing a brand new traffic signal veers away from that intention. And so we did notice some of these same issues, particularly with a high heavy vehicle percentage um, and a lot of turning movements happening here at Wheeler Street. So what we've done is tried to incorporate some remedial, remedial measures while we can't install a traffic signal. So one thing that the design will be proposing um, at this next 75% submission is an exclusive right turn lane into Wheeler Street so that some of these heavy vehicles have an exclusive lane that they can turn into and slow down before taking a right turn so that they're not bogging down that, that traffic on Route 110 behind them. Perfect, thank you, Emma. Uh, next question from Maureen Graham. A neighbor has plantings and beautified the small segment of land between Route 110 and Little Merrimack at Drake Boat. Surely I'm saying that wrong. Will this island be removed? No, I don't think we'll be removing this island. Um, I don't recall the islands that we are removing. Pretty much we're just gonna be kind of reconstructing sidewalk where, where the sidewalk is already today. Great, thank you. Right. The next question is from an anonymous attendee. There is currently a major drainage issue in the area of Haverhill Street and Route 110 and Dracut. Is MassDOT aware of this issue? If so, will this drainage issue be resolved prior to resurfacing? I'm not currently aware or of the issue, but now we are, and um, we are, you know, work, it, while we're working on environmental permitting, that also takes into account drainage. So um, we can reach out to the town to see kind of what specifically is going on for this issue. And, um, you know, if there's anything that we can do to remedy this. Um, sure, this is Brian again. Uh, thanks, thanks for that uh, location. I can reach back to our maintenance section and see if there's been any issues there and we can probably work in some kind of design fix as part of this resurfacing project. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. All right, thank you both. Um, I guess in a similar vein, Tina Rivard, Assistant Public Dir Works Director wrote, is alternative for the option that MassDOT is considering and then an additional comment, there are some drainage infrastructure upgrades in certain areas in Draca of 110 that the town would like to be considered. I think we've heard an answer on future coordination for the drainage 
Um, and so if someone could just clarify if alternate four is the option that's preferred. Yeah, if I could just get back to the drainage issue. Again, this being a resurfacing project that has to fit within the scope of work of this resurfacing project, which is a pavement preservation um, project. And we have we really can't get into major environmental permitting. So we can do whatever we can do as long as it meets or falls into a minor permit, environmental permit uh, category. But uh, we will certainly take any information that the town has and, and take a look at it and see if we can address it. Thank you. Bridget, can you just clarify the preferred alternative? Oh, yes, alternative four, yes, is the preferred alternative. Great, thank you. All right, uh, the next written question is from C. Corbin. Will the bike lanes be plowed? Where will the snow go? How will we pull out of our driveways into clumps of snow into a travel lane? I'm also concerned about the box trucks uh, and don't see how the road will be safer if narrowed. If, if I feel the guardrails and soft poles hinder the use of our driveways and front yards for general use, parking along our front yards, how will this impact us? A couple of pieces there, snow and then access to driveways. Um, I can tackle some of the plowing questions. Uh, the bike lane or shared use path will be plowed by mass DOT. I don't really know the method of how they'll plow it, but they will remove the snow and, and plow and push to the right, which uh, they would do on the roadway if it was a travel lane or shoulder. So, uh, and the idea would be to kind of make sure that no driveway is blocked with any snow banks or any um, uh, hindrances for, for cars to get out. That would be the, uh, the goal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, go the other base hand. No. You what, Bridget? No, there's just other parts to that. Okay, cool. Question. Um, it'd be the the guardrails flex post is not gonna impact anyone's yards. Um, would impact parking along the road. Um, didn't realize was um, kind of utilized today. Um, but so that would, I guess that would be the one impact would be parking, um, which I think on state road is not typically yeah. allowed. That's correct, Bridget. Uh, there is um, no legal parking, Route 110. Um, switching over to a raise hand. Uh, so Kayla can take a breather from reading with all these questions. Um, I'll start with, with Marcos. Marcos? Hi there. So Hi. I, I have a few questions. I'm, I'll try and make them quick. Um, so back to the, uh, the drainage and it's a resurfacing project and you know you can only do so much drainage improvements if drainage improvements are, are, are necessary, is this project going to be built? And then at a later date, we're going to go back and, you know, tear things up again in order to do a drainage improvement project. I mean, it seems a little counterproductive. Thank you for your question and comments. Um, we, yeah, we'd, we'd have to figure out what the extent of this drainage, you know, issues and improvements are, um, you know, we, what we don't want to be doing with this project is really changing how drainage is routed, um, you know, changing outfalls, um, really making any like wholesale uh, changes to the overall system. But if there's, you know, kind of structures that are out there already failing, you know, we can see if we can kind of replace them in kind, um, that type of thing. I mean, for instance, the, the, just recently the roadway was washed out. And mm -hmm. the state was out doing some improvements, but I, I mean, I don't even know if that's a permanent fix. Uh, it, it seems, you know, like a band aid to me, but that's my opinion. So, I mean, that, should, in my opinion, should be addressed before any resurfacing gets done. 
Uh, hi, Marcos. This is Brian Fallon from just the district. If you could forward that location uh, to us at, at the design team, we can certainly take a look at it and see if there is something we can do to uh, alleviate that, that flooding and washout condition as part of this project. So we will try our best, okay, to resolve, but as Brian just said, it's a resurfacing project. It is 6.3 miles project. So 6.3 miles. So if there's an issue, really, we'll try our best. But uh, there's some drainage study to do. It's not easy. I do leak. It's not something that you just do part of this project. Is it something that we address really okay uh, deeper? So we will see what we could do. Thank you. Um, Edward. Hi again. Uh, I do have two more questions after this, but I'll do one at a time. So to piggyback on what Mrs. Corbin mentioned earlier about uh, maintenance of the bicycle lanes, the bicycle lanes that have been constructed over at the former rotary uh, reconstruction project are currently unusable due to the amount of debris that falls out of trucks and other vehicles passing by. Uh, what I've noticed in my 23 years of living on 110 is that Mass DOT only maintains the sidewalks once a year. It, does Mass DOT plan on doing a more aggressive maintenance campaign to pick up the stone and other debris that falls out of these trucks? Or is it going to continue to be a once a year type of uh, program? Um, yes, uh, thank you for that question, Edward. I, I really can't speak to the maintenance schedule, but you know, if, if there is any issues, uh, there's always the opportunity to contact the district and we can, you know, take care of it. The, the issue is we have, you know, 62 cities and towns in this district and a lot of roads and, um, and, and now a lot of shared use paths. So, you know, we're trying to, you know, take care of things as, as we can get to them. So any um, information from abutters or people or users of, of the sidewalks or bike path would be greatly appreciated and we can uh, focus our attention when we get that information. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to circle back to uh, the q and Just want to make sure that we got everybody's comments who haven't uh, yet uh, spoken or written any questions. Uh, question, Kayla? Sure. Uh, thanks, Han. So an anonymous attendee asks, can you fix the potholes until then? Then I'm sure meaning construction. I don't know if you can put the timeline up. Um, yes, uh, this is Brian again, and the road will be maintained uh, up to the point of construction. So yeah, pothole patching and and uh, line restriping if necessary, uh, we can certainly stay on top of that up to the time when the the contract starts. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Stuart. Stuart asks, do you have statistics as to how many bikers use this stretch of road? It seems a dangerous road for bicycle use. So, uh, I think uh, uh, during the presentation, a budget show two maps so our people, our bikers was using good content during the COVID. So, and also a, we have to think about 10 years, 20 years, because we try to accommodate all type of users, not only people, a, not only drivers, so people uh, biking, people pedestrian. So this is why we accommodate all the users. So we have to think about the big picture. So not only drivers, but also people need to go to work. Is this they need to bike? People need to uh, uh, go for uh, for walking. So this is what we plan to see 10 years, 15 years, not what happened today or tomorrow. For the static sequence, so which I would uh, uh, send just an email, we'll share with you. 
the statistic on this study. Thank you. Thanks, Harriet. I'm going to go to a question now from Amy Foote. Um, I also agree with Edward and do reside on 110 and have for 20 years. I think this is going to increase traffic on 110 as it is heavily traveled throughout the day. I like the idea of sidewalks, but I believe narrowing the roads too much is a bad idea. I, I feel like we've um, covered this a little bit, but if anyone wants to speak more to operations, uh, if not, I can go to the next one. So uh, I think uh, there is a lot of study, okay, behind, okay, reduce the lane 12 to 11. So we encourage uh, people to reach out and we will share with them the data about a uh, other a, a location by doing so. There's a lot of improvement really to a uh, basically uh, help drivers to understand they have to go to respect the 25 MPH, what is said now on route 110 and nobody uh, really driving at this speed. Thanks, Harry. All right, next question I'll read is from <clears throat> Karen Schappel. Over the summer, there was a mudslide just after Haverhill Street on the north side covering the entire road. Also, part of the roadway on the south side across from Brook Street collapsed into the river. Will there be any improvements to prevent future mudslides with this project? I, yeah, that um, Brook Street collapse, that might be the location that um, Marcos pointed out earlier in the evening. So. Again, with that information, we can kind of take a look and see if there is any kind of drainage issue or, or, or whatever that we might be able to repair as part of this project. We'll certainly take a look at it. As far as the mudslide onto the state highway, that's more of an abutter issue where I don't think we're not taking any right of way as part of this project. So there's really no opportunity for us to go on to private property and, and take care of those issues. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. All right, uh, next question from Maureen Graham. A developer is planning on building a home in the small lot of land between Varnum Ave and Jackson. We as a neighborhood feel as though it will be an issue with accidents happening mostly at that intersection. We are concerned a smaller lane for cars will cause more accidents on Route 110 as a whole. Cars pass, others still on the road all the time. Just curious how this will help to limit the amount of accidents versus how the road exists now. Just thoughts on safety. I'll take this one on. So uh, the intersection at Varnum Ave in particular, we've proposed some signage and vegetation trimming to provide safety benefits for vehicles turning in and out of Varnum Ave. So that would be warning signage of an upcoming intersection and the trimming of any vegetation that might be obstructing your sight distance as you turn out of Varnum Avenue. We've also reviewed um, seven years of collision data. So we took into account any historic collision trends at these side streets like Varnum Avenue in our design. Um, and like Brian previously mentioned, some collisions that may have happened in the past may have been due to that four lane cross section. So by having a two lane cross section on Route 110 and only having one vehicle traveling in each direction, that will automatically, you know, automatically provides a safety benefit that wasn't there previously. Um, and with these narrower lanes, these vehicles are also going to be traveling at lower speeds, we hope. Um, it's the narrower lanes as well as the speed feedback signs that we've been proposing um, that we're hoping to see slower speeds, which will in turn provide safety benefit at all of these side streets. There's so much space out there right now that it's easy for cars to pass each other. That's why they're doing it. Um, you know, with the new conditions, it's gonna be driver behavior that's going to need to adjust 
and they'll quickly realize that they can't easily get around people. So they're just going to have to kind of wait for someone to turn, um, which will in turn, you know, slow down everyone on the corridor. Thank you both. Uh, the next question is from an anonymous attendee. At the east end, Lowell Street and Riverside Drive, there should be a lane for right turn only. Rather than being held back by traffic going straight, a right turn only lane would decrease back idling. Nobody ever turns left at this intersection. We're not doing much at this intersection. I know this was recently reconstructed, so we're not um, we're not looking to change anything about that intersection. Um, our you know, work here is going to be um, kind of widening the sidewalk to have it be act as more of the shared use path side path um, and narrowing the shoulders to get that room. So we're trying to do kind of as minimal amount of work at that intersection as possible so we don't trigger any major intersection changes, which could kind of throw a wrench in the project schedule and the um, overall scope. Thanks, Bridget. I think maybe we'll read one more of these questions before going back to the hands. Um, an anonymous attendee writes, can there be lanes at Griffin Brook be remarked until this project is started? It is a very dangerous area with cars constantly passing on right at extreme speed. I'm looking forward to this project. Um, yeah, as far as the existing markings go, we can certainly take a look at that and, and maintain those markings until the resurfacing project is started. Great. I will ship uh, over to raise hand. Um, Marcos. And unmute yourself now. Hi there. So, um, Two, two things that are similar, I guess. Um, one of which is uh, the Wheeler Street intersection. Um, and that's where all the uh, the big trucks pull out of from the quarry. Um, right now, when they pull out, uh, if they're conscientious, they pull into the breakdown lane to get started because they have a slow start to get going. Um, with this new design, there's nowhere for them to do that. So they are going to bring the traffic flow to a screeching halt until they finally get up to speed somewhere down the way. Is there any thoughts on that? Is there a, was that taken into effect? Hey, Emma, so you just, so. We can see if there's more room in that area to give them more space. Um, Like we're getting the right turn lane into that area coming out of it, you know, we'd have to kind of reevaluate and see if there's any more space within the, you know, state owned highway layout in order to do that. Um, well, in one area, you know, on one side, you can look at, you know, them having to speed up as, as an issue with slowing down cars behind them, they'll have to stop. That also, on the other hand, slows down the cars in general, kind of slowing down everyone along the corridor so they can't keep kind of cruising on on the high speed. So um, kind of a, a give take, um, it could be kind of a uh, frustration at first, but it overall, you know, lowers the speeds um, of people going along the corridor. Awesome. Um, shifting over to Edward. Hi. Um... As I mentioned earlier, I, I have two pieces of property on the road. One is on each, one on each side of the street. Uh, you had mentioned that they're widening, widening the sidewalk to five and a half feet. Currently, it's only about four feet. Uh, which way is it going? Is it going into the land or into the street? Uh, reason being is there's a small retaining wall at the other house I own that is on the other side of the road with the sidewalk. Uh, expanding it another foot and a half would... Uh, encroach 
through the retaining wall and uh, the utility poles there and there's a fence. So are they planning on going in towards the houses or out towards the street to widen that sidewalk to five and a half feet? Um, it varies depending on what's out there. Um, if there's nothing impeding us in the back, then we're going to hold the street side and go back towards the properties. But like you said, like if you have the retaining wall or a fence, we would not want to impact those. So in that area, we would you know, hold the back or at least kind of bring the sidewalk up to um, whatever the obstruction is. So we wouldn't have to um, disturb any fences or retaining walls. Great. Um, I'm going to shift over to the Q&A. Um, I'm going to straight, jump straight into uh, C. Carbon. Uh, he or she asked, how will we get mail deliveries and garbage pickup? Uh, will they be driving uh, in the bike lane to provide the services to us? On that side of the road, they may need to, you know, kind of pull in kind of more towards the into the bike lane area um, when they do their mail deliveries or pick up if they have to kind of pull over to the side of the road. Should I shift should, should over to this uh, slide? So on the river side? Um, I, don't, I don't know if that there's a slide that really Which slide gets that? into that, but um, I'm assuming you're, you know, talking about uh, properties on the, on the river side, on the bike lane side. So um, yeah, there'll be there'll be breaks in the buffer um, in order for people to get in and out. And also, you know, in case any, like a garbage truck or mail delivery needs to kind of pull over. Great. Uh, I'm going to jump uh, over to the anonymous attorney who asked, um, so you're planning to build the project and then revisit the possible we access and possibly we access this, we assess the speed limit after the fact? That would be a, a goal, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Another anonymous uh, ask, will there be another public webinar hearing before the project is approved? Oh, uh... I'm not so sure because we have the the twenty five percent disability hearing, so we will review all the comments and uh, to see. But for now, we think we will try our best okay to uh, address and make the uh, changes. But if there's a lot of things need to be addressed, that's a, a possibility. But also during the meantime, I'd like, I'd like to elaborate on that is um, if you have any additional comments or questions, um, please uh, feel free to email um, the project team at MassDOT project management at dot, dot state dot ma dot us um, or you know, with the QR code that you see on the screen here, you can get jump straight into the uh, handout for the website um, for the project itself, I mean. Uh, lastly, the question here from Robert, uh, how much land will be taken uh, on the north side of the Merrimack Avenue Dracut? Also, is it a common practice to have bike lane on State Highway? So the actual layout of Route 110 is varies from 60 to 82 feet. <clears throat> um, that's like the state owned portion of the roadway. So it extends behind what is seen as just the roadway or the sidewalk limit. Um, it does vary. Sometimes the layout line is kind of really close to the back of sidewalk. Other times the layout line is set back, you know, another 10 feet or so. Um, right now we don't have any easements, so we're not taking any property from anyone um, for this. It's all being done within the state's owned um, laid out. Um, but, you know, like we mentioned, the on the north side, we're pretty much just reconstructing the sidewalk. So if, if it is narrow in some areas, maybe, you know, we're adding a foot or two to the sidewalk just to get up to that 
five feet or five and a half with the curb. Um, and then, you know, there might be a little bit of just grading and um, just a tie in behind that, but there's not going to be any kind of major earthwork behind um, the sidewalk. And also, yeah. there is a, you know, the, but the, if we provide biking, some people will maybe use their bike instead of driving a car. So that could also reduce okay the volume of cars okay on the on route one ten because there's the alternative to, to bike instead of driving your car. It's and it possible. is yeah, and it is common. I guess to answer your question, it is common practice now um, for any state's projects, whether it's on the state owned roadway or a locally owned roadway that the state's involved in um, to incorporate um, some type of bike accommodation. Um, it's, a, it's a design directive that's um, all projects need to follow. Great, thank you. And lastly, we're gonna shift over to the raise hand, Marcos. Thank you again. So I have two, two things I'd like to address. One is snow removal. Um, it was touched upon regarding the shared use lane, but as far as plowing the, 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 the roadway itself, if you're familiar with that road at all, there's a lot of snow that gets plowed and then they come back and push it back, which typically ends up pushing it over the guardrail to widen the road, et cetera. The road is going to be so restricted now because of all the lanes. Where is all the snow going to go? And secondly, I would like to go back to the uh, speed issue after you answer that question, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Marcos. That That is a good question, and I really can't answer the exact way it's going to be plowed or the snow is going to get removed. My guess is they're going to have to probably, you know, get some kind of front end loader to take off some snow that is up against the guardrail and remove it that way. But at the, at, we will discuss it at some point in the future on the right way to uh, take the snow off the side of the road with the, um, the guardrail in place. Okay, so that that being said, and it not being determined yet, that it, it, let's say you use a loader for that. Now you're taking up the, the entire lane in order to remove the snow. So now it's going to cause more of a traffic issue. Um, that's just a comment. But I want to go back to the, uh, the speed issue um, because uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, you know, hit the nail on the head. Um, he's been living there a long time. I don't live on that road, but I travel daily. Very, very, very familiar. Every bump and every curve and everything. I was alive, not driving, but when it was four lane road and then it reduced to two lanes, as he mentioned. This is going to be a nightmare. If you're familiar with the road now, the way it, the way it flows, the way everything happens, I don't know how much time the state has spent out there, but by restricting that road anymore, you know, yeah, we all wish and hope and pray that, you know, the drivers will adjust to the new way, but reality is another story. I mean, for instance, the other day, there was so much traffic on that road because everybody's trying to bypass 93 due to the accident. They all took that road. There is so much traffic on this road in the morning and in the afternoon. It's to slow it down anymore is going to be a nightmare. And especially, like I mentioned before, with the heavy trucks, I don't think you truly understand what, I, what I'm referring to how slow they go when they first get going you are going to bring that 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 lane to a screeching halt so i don't know if anybody spent any time out there and actually witnessed it or we're just going off statistics so uh marcos what uh, i think uh, we already address this question, this question back and back and back again is the same question. So we encourage you, okay, to uh, formulate your question. I think it's already on the chat. So we will provide you the information you need to show you, okay, all the, it's not only like that, okay, we're just doing this. Okay, there's data, okay, there is a, a basically survey okay for that 
So if you need to see this information, so we could maybe email you, share with you some information so you'll understand what we're coming with this uh, design. Because we see we have a four alternative. This is the, the alternative four is the one that best, okay, address, okay, the need for a differentiate from a low, okay, to mid to end. Great. Um, I'm going to shift over to the Q&A. Uh, I'm seeing that uh, C. Carbon had uh, wrote another question as well as a comment here. Uh, was there any consideration uh, to just add sidewalks on both sides of the road? Uh, they would get more use uh, around here in Methuen than a bike path. So when addressing those projects, we can't kind of just do sidewalks and not address bikes. They would have to, bikes would have to be addressed in some manner. Um, so that's one piece of it. The other issue is if we add a sidewalk to the south side of the road, then we're getting into kind of, you know, a curbed sidewalk, which really changes the drainage out there. Then we're going to be kind of adding a bunch of catch basins along this road and kind of having to redesign the whole closed drainage system out there, um, which is gonna kind of change the outlets. And we're right at the Merrimack River. So we're getting into a significant permitting effort um, when you um, curb kind of a six mile road like that when it currently does not have that curb. Great. Um, and moving on to Stuart. Uh... While a right lane, right turn lane will help with westbound trucks entering Wheeler Street, what what can be done about trucks entering 110 from Wheeler Street? They lined up while waiting for traffic and caused long backups on Wheeler Street. So I think someone uh, we address this issue i think uh, we provide a right turn so this i think is a uh, there's someone from a a drag a, a, a maybe a couple months ago was talking about that and i don't know if you could elaborate Bridget. i think you plan to provide a right turn because there's a bunch of a a developer, there's a developer there doing some a, a housing, so and also there's a bunch of chalk using there. So I think we will provide a white turn if I'm not misspoken. Right, we're, we're providing the right turn lane in. He, I think he's more asking about coming out of Wheeler Street um, and just kind of waiting for the trucks to get out. Um, obviously, we've had a lot of comments about Wheeler Street tonight. Um, which is, you know, we've gotten a lot of information feedback, uh, so we can kind of take that now and see if there's any any additional improvements that would be done at that location. I know Harry, I just mentioned there, you know, we have heard that there is a also like a residential development maybe going on there, and um, you know, well, it's not coordinated with this project at all. Um, cause that's kind of a separate, totally separate thing. But you know, maybe there's improvements that maybe that project can also do to make improvements at Wheeler Street as well. But um, we can definitely take the information that we've heard here tonight about that location to see if there's any other changes that we can do. Thank you. Um, another comment came in from Robert. Uh, I'm concerned about the speed limit going forward for, for this project. It needs to be lowered to 30 or 35. Um, the public on this road average 60 mile per hour on a good day. And I think the traffic study should be done before moving forward. Thank you for the comment. Do you have anything? Yeah, I think Brian mentioned it earlier. We Unfortunately, we can't just change the speed limit. Um, you know, uh, even if we would like to um, right now, like the only kind of mechanisms in order to do that is a speed study, which takes into account speeds that are actually being traveled on. So if they're going even faster than, you know, 45 miles per hour today, we could end up with a 
situation where we don't get the result, we get an opposite result of what we would actually want. Um, that's why, you know, with all these countermeasures we're putting in and the change of the cross section, if we, you know, that in itself can help lower speed limits, then there's that opportunity after, that's why that was mentioned before, then there's that opportunity to come back. Um, and if people are driving slower, then to do that speed, speed study, um, and then we can lower the speed limit. Okay, and also we will be uh, looking for cooperation from the, the police there also to reinforce, okay, the size. So if someone is driving too fast, so they will have a warning, something like that, because if there's size saying you have to go 35, if you go more than that, okay, there should be some uh, enforcement from police, uh, maybe state police or a or a municipality police. Thank you. I also want to be mindful of our um, language interpreters who have been on with us for almost two hours now. Uh, if you have uh, additional comments, uh, please, please uh, email it to us. I think that's the best way to communicate uh, at mass DOT project management at dot.state.ma.us. There we can provide a more thoughtful and meaningful response to your questions and comments. But before I um, you know, move on to the very last questions here, um, just want to uh, remind people that we do have our language interpreters who are uh, still working on the clock and who've been almost two hours on the, the meeting. So the last comments here were from Karen uh, said valid point from Marcos regarding the accident on Route um, 33 that happened in the past, this past Monday. When there is a major accident on uh, 30, 93, I meant to say 93, sorry, dyslexic. The traffic spills uh, onto Route 110 seeking an alternative route. These commuters uh, expect the traffic to flow on uh, 110 without uh, interruption. Has this factor been taken into consideration? Yeah, um, Hung, that is, that is a good point. And, and I wanted to follow up uh, on Marcus's point uh, also. The traffic calming is really going to calm traffic in kind of a free flow condition. In other words, when there's not a lot of traffic on the road where people do feel like they can speed or go faster because of light traffic, wide lanes, wide shoulders. So that's where we're going to kind of get the benefit of traffic calming. For a situation where if there's an accident on 93 and all the traffic is diverted onto 110, we're really not changing that condition. I don't think we can improve the condition on a resurfacing project. But we're still, we're not eliminating lanes. So, you know, this it's going to be the same traffic in the same conditions, whether it be on a wide lane and a wide shoulder or a narrower lane with a narrower shoulder. So... I think we're expecting things to be kind of the same in that kind of traffic congestion condition. But we want the traffic calming when there is free flow, there is light traffic on the road. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I will here, uh, Edward, uh, let's go with Marcos. Marcos. Thank you again. So, you. to Brian's point that he just made, and then I'm going to go on to my point. So, I understand the whole calming effect thing. However, there's not enough room on the road in order for cars to turn off into side streets, driveways, businesses, etc. So, that calming effect is going to be interrupted repeatedly from one stretch to the other as you're driving down the road. So that calming effect, people are gonna be white knuckling it because they're gonna be so aggravated with, with road rage. That being said, um, has anybody taken into account the businesses, um, the high volume businesses on the south side, for instance, like JG's ice cream, the amount of traffic that flows in and out of there in peak season, how that's going to work, uh, how that's going to be interrupted or how that's going to interrupt the traffic flow? 
Thank you for your question and comment. So uh, could you share with us uh, uh, the location uh, of these businesses? So we're talking about with Marcoso. Okay. So yeah, uh, it's, it's on the it's on the east side. Near Walbrook Street. Slide. So we do know we, we we are aware of, of you know businesses like that um in their their functionality. Um you know it's Sorry. So we would have to, you know, we're not impacting their um, property. I'm sorry, uh, to... Bridget. I'm sorry, yeah. we lost you for a second. So if you could just go back and repeat your answer so I have it clear for the record. Thank you. Sure. Just noting that we are aware of that property um, and their use um, and that the design is not going to kind of change the flow of their property, um, their access in and out of their property. Um, but again, that's, you know, good information to take into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Edward, last question. I, my last question, um, I promise. <laughs> um, is there any way of getting a follow-up meeting on this? There's a lot of legitimate concerns and speaking with 25 years of law enforcement history, uh, working in this specific area and living here for 23 years, trying to get, you know, a fully loaded tractor trailer weighing 100,000 pounds to stop as you're trying to turn left into your driveway with no avenue of escape. I also have a class A commercial driver's license. So I know how to drive these things. It's nearly impossible to stop them. And I'd be remiss if you, I didn't say that truck drivers aren't always paying attention. So we're removing their avenue of escape to avoid rear-ending somebody. Now, I've had people pull into my driveway been rear-ended before uh, by people not paying attention. Is, is there any way we can get another meeting to address these concerns to see how we're going to deal with this? Like I, my first question, passing the garbage truck which is eight feet wide with another over eight foot wide truck do the math that's 16 feet if they rub sides that puts you five feet into oncoming traffic so, so this these are things that the 25 years of public safety seriously need to be addressed i have run out of my house at two in the morning way too many times to assist motor vehicle crashes out in front of my house i don't want to double that effort i am going to be retiring soon but I will still be running out of my house at two in the morning when there are crashes here. And th these are going to escalate when you remove the avenue of escape. So my question is, is there any way we can possibly get a follow-up meeting as to how these questions are going to be concerned, uh, addressed? Thank you. So what I just said, uh, now is a for the twenty five percent design public hearing, so we will address all comments and questions. And if there is a need, okay, at the seventy five percent, so we will review that. But a uh, we give you the opportunity, give us the opportunity to address this issue, and from that point. Okay, we could make a decision on that. Great, thank you so much. Um, Marcos, last question for tonight. Okay, so, so much to say. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm with Officer Johnson. I, I, th I think there's so much left to be discussed um, and addressed and researched on your end um, because I think there's a lot of unanswered questions. That's that's number one. Number two, um, we didn't really you didn't really answer my whole question regarding JG. It's okay, it's not going to affect their business, but how's it going to affect the traffic flow when somebody stops to turn into there? And again, in peak season, there's a lot of traffic pulling in and out. 
you are going to stop the entire roadway because there is nowhere for the car behind the stop car to go to go around them while they wait to turn into the into the business. Um, so I, I don't know how that's going to be addressed. And I think there's a lot of safety concerns left to be addressed. Um, and one, one last thing I want to mention is if I were to um, put in a business on anywhere, uh, let's say a Dunkin' Donuts. I owned a Dunkin' Donuts. I was going to put in a Dunkin' Donuts. It's a high traffic uh, business. I would be required to do a traffic study. And if necessary, I would possibly be required to make traffic improvements for the, for, for the safety sake. Somehow, I don't know how this project is skipping that step because there are a lot of safety concerns here and a lot of traffic issues that really aren't being addressed and are kind of being, in, in my opinion, kicked down the road. Um, thank you for your comments and uh, question. Uh, I think we, based on what Harry said earlier, we had a lot to think about uh, and all the information you, uh, the public had provided uh, up to this point. And it's definitely um, something that we need to take into consideration. Um, so uh, once again, I think that uh, the most appropriate place at this point is to submit uh, your comments uh, and your questions into uh, the email you see in the screen. Here, mass dot project management at dot.state.ma.us. And from there, we will gather all of the uh, comments. And as we advance the, the design of the project, uh, we will definitely think of consideration of additional uh, public outreach um, based on uh, the, the information I just came in. So, with that, do you that. have anything to add to that? I was looking at on that last comment. We do submit a very detailed traffic um, study along with our design. Um, it's different than the type of traffic study you would do for like a, like you mentioned, like a private development, but um, it does take into account all the traffic count data, crash data, crash history, and it is you know a requirement for um, the state. So there was a traffic study done for this. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, also a uh, district for is your district, uh, Marcos. So if you need if you need some explanation, you could reach out okay to your district that will give you a, a, how the maintenance they will maintain. There's some the section that really focus on maintenance, they will give you. How they do that? Are they going to blow? Because they know it's their job. They know how to do that, and they're doing a good job on that. And if we need this data, okay, so we could not give you the data like that. But there's a, a proper, there's a way. If you need them, we could give you access to this data. Okay, so I think uh, we. There's no other questions, so that's all? Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for attending. We look forward to hearing from all of you. The design public hearing now ended at 7.55 p.m. Have a good night. I just want to make sure before um, the panelists leave, maybe just one or two of you could stay on because I just have a couple of questions and we are off the record. No problem. Um, okay, so. Um. Hi, so just a couple of things that I wasn't able to get. Can um, JG's ice cream, that business, how should I write that down into the transcript? Is that... Is that it's one? a it's J A Y dash G E. Okay, thank you. And then um one word. There's, I, oh, okay, that there's still this is still um it's still 